Coming to you live from our top secret broadcasting bunker here at Area 52. This is the hologram of Pastor Mike. And this hologram is here. It's not, Pastor Mike is not a real person. I'm just a computer generated facsimile of some guy. That's what, that's, I'm not kidding you. That's what some guy put on a web page. And he had proof. He had, he had absolute undeniable proof that the New World Order and the Illuminati elite had such sophisticated computer software and hardware that they were able to concoct a hologram of a guy named Mike Hoggard and have him do all these videos that were very, very subtly bringing people in by way of the King James Bible into submission to the New World Order. You can't, you can't make this stuff up. Well, apparently this guy did make it up. Uh, anyway, just a little humor today. My mind is not on Pastor Mike online. I can tell you that right now. And it's not, not anything bad, not anybody's fault. There's nothing wrong. Um, I am trying to put together the, the, the outline and the script for the next few Watchmen broadcasts. Uh, that's what I've been doing. I'm trying to put it together. Um, I am... If you've been if you if you've been watching the series here lately, uh, I've been dealing with the singularity, the idea that the computers are going to be so smart, um, they're going to take over. Mankind literally is building his own god, and um, then the other part of the singularity is is that we're going to discover a way. By inspiration, I believe we're going to mankind is going to discover a way to turn his body into a hybrid of biology and technology. Those days are, they're coming fast. And one of the problems that I'm running into is there is now so much information being just going, it's going nuts. So many articles that I'm, I'm trying to read and digest. So the, uh, even video clips that I'm watching, trying to educate myself a little bit about what's going on um, as far as understanding artificial intelligence. As far, uh, I, I did hear that this, this, the simplest way to understand artificial intelligence is to ask anybody who works for the government. It, <laughs> It is, um, it's election day across the country. Some say it's a, a minor elections, uh, but I don't think so. I think that there is going to be a shift in the balance of power in the United States of America, and Barack Hussein is going to find himself with a, um, a very adversarial Congress. Some say that's good, some say that's bad, some say it doesn't matter. The course of the New World Order is going to continue. That much I think I agree with. I think God's course for this world um, is on course and still on course, and nothing's going to interfere with that. Uh, but anyway, I'm trying to understand artificial intelligence. I am trying to, I'm trying to make the connection, and I'm just going to go ahead and throw this out here. And maybe some of you watchers out there, maybe you, maybe you can give me a little, little blurb or a little concept or a little idea of, of what you see. I, I'm trying to make sense of exactly how the computer world is going to merge with our human world. I'm trying to make sense of, of how it's... I know it's going to happen. I know beyond any doubt that that's going to happen. I'm trying to understand how it's going to happen. I'm trying to understand the relationship um, between man merging with technology. And when I say technology, I'm talking about um, computers. I'm talking about artificial 
abilities, abilities that you and I were not born with, things that they're going to put into our brains and in our bodies and in our organs. Um, I'm, I was reading some things yesterday, and it's just it's blowing my mind the number of life functions that my body has right now that the world of nanoparticles, nanobots, um, DNA being used as a, as a uh, hardware and software mechanism, the number of things in my body that can be augmented and according to these people should be augmented, including my own blood. When I read that yesterday, I, I paused and, I, and I'm thinking my mind is going right to my Bible trying to understand the implication of that. If they alter our blood, well, I won't say ours. They're not touching mine. But if they alter mankind's blood, what does the Bible have to say about that? How is that connected with Scripture? Because I believe that if it's happening or if it's going to happen, God wrote it down in our Bibles. Can I hear you say amen? It's exactly what I believe. And uh, I'm trying to, uh, that's what I'm trying to make sense of. I'm trying to see what's going on in the light and through the eyes of the King James Bible. So I'm, I'm kind of at a, a standstill. So I, I spent all morning just thinking and, and reading some things, studying the Scripture, and then I ran into, and, and I've had this in the back of my mind for a while, I, I'm looking at what quantum computing is and how it works and what it will do. And here's the problem. Most of the people who are involved in building quantum computers and study quantum computing itself, most of the people who are making the quantum computers don't really understand how it works. They, don't, they, they know it does. They just don't understand it. And there is a, there is a, a part of a quantum computer that I, I kind of have a grasp on as far as what the Bible says. Um, and I didn't know if I want to try to explain it now. Uh, you know what? Maybe I will. Uh, by the way, today is free day. I've got uh, some uh, Perry Stone and Sid Roth video clips I'm going to show you. And you're just going to go, I can't believe that they believe that. Well, believe that they believe that because that's what they believe. Uh, then we're going to go to the scriptures. I'm going to show you the danger out of Jesus' own mouth. I'm going to show you the danger of the Hebrew Roots Movement following after the rabbis, following after these men who are, who are blinded according to the scriptures. They don't see right. Why should we follow them when they don't have an understanding? And this is, this is Perry Stone, and this is uh, Sid Roth, and this is Jim Staley, and this is um, all these other Hebrew Roots cult followers. They're trying to tell you that the wisdom that we need to under, understand the real Jesus and the real gospel and the real word and the real purpose of God, that we need to go after blind men to follow them and ask them, how to believe and ask them how they see the Messiah, how they see redemption, how they see this and how they see that. Follow after them. And I absolutely not. Absolutely not. You don't do that. And I'll show you from Scripture why. Uh, so we're going to talk about that, and I'm going to open it up today to your comments and questions. Uh, we'll take the good, the bad, and the ugly. And you see the email address there at the bottom of the screen, Pastor Mike online at gmail.com. And uh, go ahead and prepare to send them in, any comments or questions that you have. But uh, let, let me just explain what I learned about quantum computing. 
Um, well, I wish I had a, a graphic or an illustration or something like that. Let's, um, let me do this. I'll do this. I'll use my, my Samsung quantum computing mobile device. Okay. Right now, the screen is blank. And let's just pretend that this is off, even though we know it's not off. And we have heard that the NSA and other agencies have the ability to turn this on whenever they want to and turn the microphone on and the camera on and the GPS and read all your text messages. And, that, and we're just talking about what Facebook has the ability to do with your phone. When you put Facebook on your phone, you are giving Facebook, Inc. the right to access your microphone, your camera, your text messages, your email, your location, what you had for breakfast, your heart rate. I mean, you give Facebook access to you and your personal private life. That's what you do when you put a Facebook on you. I took it off. When I, this is an Android phone. Android will show you a list of things that your phone, do, that, a, that software does on your phone. And I read Facebook and I went, nah, I'm getting it off of there. And I took it off. So let's pretend that this phone right now is off. I'm going to hit a switch. And now the phone is on. Isn't that beautiful? Now watch this. I'm going to hit a switch. Oh, it went off. Now I'm going to hit a switch again. It's on, it's off, it's on, it's off. See how simple that is? The switch is either on or off. Let's do that again, children. On, off. Boy, I should have been on Sesame Street. You know what? That is computing in a nutshell. That is the very basic principle behind how a computer does what it does. And this goes back again to the 1940s, the 1950s, when mankind started building these humongous machines that took up three or four floors of a building. They were so huge. And the reason why they were so big was they were using... Um, they were using tubes, vacuum tubes, with connections in it. That's, they didn't have the, the circuits and the transistors. They didn't have anything like that. They had, these, they had people working nonstop, just going around, changing tubes in these machines. But here's how they programmed it. They programmed the, the machine in, in these very basic, basic instructions they wanted to ask the machine what 2 plus 2 was. The way that you program that machine and the way you ask that machine is that you flip this switch on, and over next to it, this switch goes off. And let's say that you're going to deal with the number 1. In binary code, binary means, by means 2, and it relates to switches being on and off, on or off, the binary code for, um, for the number one is zero, 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 one, which would basically mean three switches are off and one switch is on. That's binary for the number one. The number two would be zero, zero, one, zero. I don't ask me why, but two switches are off. One is on and the other one's off. Okay. You don't have to memorize all of this. That's just, that's how simple it is. And it's just like turning light switches on and off. Something that most children don't know how to do is turn off a light switch. They know that it goes on. They just don't know that it goes off. So these computers were being programmed in binary by literally guys in lab coats with clipboards reading what should be on and off, and that's how they programmed these computers. That same principle, now, even though they built transistors and circuit boards and they don't have tubes and they don't have physical switches anymore, they had developed over the years the ability for a transistor to have some sort of virtual switch in it, and it would either allow 
an electric current to go through or not allow an electric current to go through it. And if it wasn't allowed, that was the switch was off. And if it was allowed, then the switch was on. And so you, your computer that you've got right now, and it doesn't matter if it's if it's a DVD player or a CD player or your um, your cable box, every one of them are computers. And they all operate on the principle of a switch being off zero or a switch being on one. So my phone, my computer array here, my tablet, my little mixer board here has got a little got a little microprocessor in it. Uh, what else has? Probably absolutely your phone, tablet, computer. Most everything with some sort of electronic circuit board in it has a computer in it, and it switches on and off. That is classical computing, they call it. It's just like Coke classic. It's the same flavor, the same taste. Now we get into quantum computing. This is where it gets to this is what I sort of hit upon today. Quantum computing goes beyond whether a switch is on or off. It goes beyond that. And I, I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around this, but here's, here's what it is. In quantum computing, it still uses the switch system, and the switch can be off, or the switch can be on, or the switch can be both on and off at the same time. So I want you to think about this. Let's put it in terms of things that we see in uh, mythology, things that we have studied here, Watchman Broadcast, Pastor Mike Online, things that we see in the Bible. Let's say that the switch on represents Osiris, the sun god. The switch off represent, see the switch on is up, the switch off is down. Let's say the switch off represents Isis. And in the myth, Osiris mated with Isis and produced a child that was the, the fusion of them both together, which was Horus. Let's look at another example. In Genesis chapter 1, God said, uh, let there be light and there was light. And God saw the light that it was good, and universally, in just about every culture in the world, light equals goodness, darkness equals evil. God saw the light that it was good, and then God did something. He divided the light from the darkness. Think of a light switch. Light and darkness. He divided them because the two of them don't go together. You cannot have light darkness. You cannot have dark light. You can have bud light, but you can't have, and coke light, but you can't have dark light. God divided the light from darkness. And so God says in, uh, what was it Paul said? First Corinthians uh, chapter 6, I think it was. What, uh, what agreement hath light with darkness? There is none. What, what, what is there between the temple of God and idols? What concord hath Christ, who is light, with Belial, who is darkness? Zero. But then you have quantum computing, where light and darkness, zero and one, switches on or off, merge together, and they're both at the same time. And it, I'm just... Number one, I'm, I kind of get the principle because I see that clearly in the Bible, but I have no idea how that works. And according to what I read, most of the scientists who work on this every day and study it, they're going, yeah, okay, so what is zero and one together? They'll go, yeah, that's, it's, it is what it is. They have no idea, but they know it works. They know it works. There is another aspect and something that just hit me today, and I'm just, I'm going, why didn't I see that before? 
that I think I'm going to hold on to until I develop it more. But we really are, in every sense of the word, creating a God. And you ask yourself the questions, what does, what does a God mean to mankind? How has mankind interacted with a God, whether it's our God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or some pagan God? How has man interacted with his God? And it dawned on me today. I get that part of it. I get it. So there, I will probably start working on some things that I found out today, putting it together as far as quantum computing. And uh, by the way, there, this, is, this is another interesting thing. I don't know what it means yet. In, in classical computing, the switch on or the switch off, these are referred to as bits, B-I-T-S, little bits of information. The first computers that came out back in the 80s, the home computers, the Commodores and the Apples and the, even the Atari 2600 game machines with the, that you could convert to a computer, they were 8-bit machines. In other words, 8 switches for one piece of information. In other words, you would have 8 switches in a row that would represent one character up on the screen like the letter A or the letter B or the number 1 or, or whatever it was. You had eight switches that defined that character. The computers that came after that were the 16 bits. That's what Windows 3.1 and Windows 95 was based upon. Then you had in the, in the 2000s, you had the 32-bit computers. And now we're up to 64. Now we have 64 different switches that represent one piece of information. And I don't quite get all that either. But anyway, that's what it is. And so a bit would be a, either the switch is on or a switch is off. But in quantum computing, you have more than just bits. Switch on, switch off. You have switch on, off, which they call qubit, Q-U-B-I-T. And it's meant to sound like the word qubit in the Bible. I don't know what that means yet but I'm going to look into it. Now, I took a long time to say all this. My mind is just reeling with, with trying to learn this, trying to learn it so I can see the scriptural side of it and then present it to everybody. I don't have it ready yet. It's not, I, I don't even know what all the ingredients to this little stew called the Watchman Broadcast. I don't have all the ingredients yet. I, don't, I haven't got it yet. So I'm going to work until I get it ready. And which it may be that there may not be a Watchman broadcast coming out this Sunday. So just bear with me while I try to learn, while I try to um, understand what's going on, see the scriptural part of it, present it. That way you and I have a good understanding of what's going on in this world, what our King James Bible says about it. Now, I'm, I'm going to segue that into a clip or a couple of clips that I'm going to show you. I want you to take your Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 23, and also Galatians. We're going to be in those two places. Matthew chapter 23. This is what kind of jumped into my mind today. Somebody sent me this clip, and I appreciate it. You, you, you watch some of these things, and I can't remember who sent it to me. Um, I apologize for that. Uh, I could probably pull it up, but anyway, uh, it got my attention. I have mentioned to you in the past uh, the dangers of Perry Stone. Sid Roth, who has all of these, it's supernatural wacko time, has all these people on his show, people that he knows will favor extra biblical revelations, extra biblical events. Everything that's not in your Bible will be on it's supernatural. That's how, that's how he works. Perry Stone 
wants everybody to think that he is mainstream Mr. Bible Scholar. But in fact, he is not. He is a Hebrew Roots student. He truly believes... Let's see if I can find it here. Hang on a second. Hang on. I got I to gotta see if I can find this. See if, I, see if my headphone will reach it. Hang on. Up, 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 up. Is it right here? Right here. Yeah, here we go. Here we go. Ready? This is going to be from Perry Stone's own face. The quote that I'm going to give you is from Perry Stone's own face. It's in a book. So this would be his face book. Here we go. This is Perry Stone's book, Breaking the Code of the Feast. He says, um, if you're familiar with our weekly telecast, manifest you're aware that the emphasis of our teaching and preaching ministry is threefold. To win people to Christ, help them grow in the grace of God. Sounds good. To minister a right now prophetic word and help discern the times and seasons. You know what a right now prophetic word is? I made it up in my head and it's not in your Bible. That's what a right now prophetic word is. I made it up. I didn't read it in Scripture. I will not tell you now. God gave me a word for you, and it's in the book of Judges, chapter 8, verse 16 and 17. Go read that. That's not what he's talking about. He's ta- these people operate in these, oh, I'm getting a prophecy. Ooh, God's giving me a word now. He's downloading it into my brain as we speak, and now I'm going to give it to you. You don't have to listen to that if you don't want. You don't have, in fact, I would say don't. It's, he made it up. He is building a wall with untempered mortar. Go read Ezekiel 13. But then his, his third uh, part is to teach believers the Hebraic roots of their faith. Now, that sounds biblical, but it's snot. Sounds biblical, but it's snot. The Hebraic roots that he's going to teach you are not going to come from Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Pro, uh, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. It's not going to come from any of those 39 books. It's going to come from outside of the Old Testament. It's going to come from rabbis. It's going to come from from rabbinical scholars, rabbinical sages. You hear him talk about, use phrases like that all the time. I, I checked with the rabbis and got what the rabbis said. That's what he's going to teach you. You need to understand that these rabbis, these scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, Jesus was adamantly opposed to them and their teaching and their understanding. Matthew 23. So here is Perry Stone now. He's on Sid Roth. It's supernatural. And they're talking about, they're bragging about Perry Stone's new series on the, on the Hebraic Feast and the Four Blood Moons hoax and what Perry Stone does, and I'm not going to play the whole thing. What Perry Stone does is that he talks about how he has discovered. And actually, he, the rabbis always understood that. When you had a blood moon or a lunar or um, yeah, it was a, a solar eclipse, lunar eclipse, when you had an eclipse of the moon's surface where the, where the earth shadowed the moon, surface and the moon surface turned to a sort of an orange color, when you had that on a Jewish feast day or a, they use the term major Jewish feast day, when you had a blood moon on a major Jewish feast day, then within 12 to 48 months of that event, something significant happened with the nation of Israel. And he mentions one on there one happened in 1492. That's when Columbus discovered America. Ooh, wow. That means nothing to the Jews. Big deal. Who cares? 
That's his premise. That's his story, and he's sticking to it. And for your donation of $60, you can get his book free of charge. And so he's on uh, Sid Roth. They're bragging about this book, bragging about, um, uh, about how it works. And, and you're going to hear, you're going to hear uh, Perry Stone, number one. He's, let me set this part up here. I've got three different parts of this. The first part is Perry Stone is going to, you're going to hear him talk about, um, what is he going to talk about? He's going to talk about how he, he follows after the rabbis. I hope I did it right. Let's take a listen to it. I, what I did, I studied it from a rabbinical perspective. Now, in the rabbinical perspective, lunar eclipses and solar eclipses. A solar eclipse is when the moon looks orange or looks blood. All right. There is that section of it right there. I'm going to wait for the other one. But I want us to go and understand what he said in light of scriptures. Now, let me, let me point this out to you. From Perry Stone to John Hagee to uh, Mark Biltz, and any of these other Hebrew Roots people or sensationalist video makers that has gone after this four-blood moon hoax. Why do I say it's a hoax? Because you're not going to see anything in the Bible. God says nowhere in your Bible that when a blood moon happens on a feast day, something bad happens to Israel. But that's their case. That's their concept. That's their idea. That's what they're trying to sell you, literally. That's what they're trying to sell you, is that when a blood moon happens on a major feast day, then something bad happens to Israel, which has been done. I, I, if you remember, we did a, a thing on this. I don't remember how many times blood moons happen on or around the time of a Jewish feast day, and nothing happened, not one thing. But this is what they're trying to sell you. But God never said anything about it. So here, since Perry couldn't find what he wanted in the Bible. His idea is, if you can't find it in the Bible, then go find, go find it somewhere else, and then we'll make believe that it's just as true as the Bible, and you're going to hear Sid Roth. I'm not even going to tell you what he said. Just hang on to it. Let's go to Matthew chapter 20. Let's see what Jesus said about these Jewish scholars, these rabbis, or these robs that Jim Staley likes to talk about. Matthew chapter 23. This is what you're going to get when you decide you're going to follow the rabbis. Matthew 23. Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples. He said it in front of everybody. The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, but do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne. You contrast that with what Jesus said about his burden. Take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And I have found I would much rather be yoked to the Lord Jesus Christ than be yoked to the rabbis or anybody else for that matter. He says, they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. You know what the phylacteries were? It's those little cubes that the Hasidic Jews, which are Kabbalists, they put cubes on their forehead. It's a mark on their forehead. There's something about that. Um, I will always tell you, I've got some notes. I don't know where I'm going to put it. If you've watched the Transformer movies, what was the all spark? What was it? It was a cube, wasn't it? 
The AllSpark is what gave life to a dead piece of electronics, like a toaster. If a toaster came in contact with the AllSpark, which is the spark of divinity from the Kabbalah, if a toaster came in contact with the AllSpark, then the toaster now was a living creature. I'm going to make toast for the new world order. That's what, they, that's what it was. That's what a phylactery is. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. You know what? They, they want to be seen of everybody. And love the uppermost room at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues. And greetings in the markets and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. This is Perry Stone. This is Jim Staley. This is Mark Biltz. This is all of those, uh, Rabbi Ralph, think about it. Rabbi Ralph Messer loves for every, everybody to call him Rabbi. Think about it. He is one that Jesus is referring to here in Matthew 23. They want that title of Rabbi, or these Hebrew roots people are following after men who demand you call them Rabbi. You better, I'm a, don't just call me Shlomo or Moisha. You call me Rabbi Shlomo. They demand it. But be ye not called Rabbi. And I don't know how, I don't know how, you hear Jim Staley talking all the time. He never, well, I won't say never, but he, try, he tries to get you to stop thinking of Paul as an apostle. Paul the apostle. Why? Because Paul the apostle's message was, you're saved without the works of the law. In contrast, Staley says, he's not the apostle Paul, he's Rav Shaul, Rabbi Saul. And he constantly refers to him that way. In order to get you to believe that the Apostle Paul was really on Jim Staley's side, his writings just got messed up and paganized by the Greeks. That's what he wants you to believe. But they, he wants you to believe that he really is Rav or Rabbi Saul, Rav Shaul, so that you will believe Staley when he says, got to go keep the law if you're saved. That's what he says. So here he says, be, and, and, but be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. Does that make it clear? We only have one master. Even those who refer to me as Pastor Mike, that's my, that's my position, that is my uh, office that God has called me into as a pastor or a bishop of the church. You've never seen anywhere where I demand you call me Pastor Mike. You do it out of respect. You do it out of, of, of whatever reason. But I don't make anybody call me Pastor Mike. I don't, I don't make my wife either. You just call me Mike if you want to, because that's who I, we're brethren, remember? But if, if you are part of my church and you want to call me Pastor, knock yourself out. But don't demand it. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Hey, Roman Catholics, that's you. That's for all y'all. But now look at this, verse 11. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exhausted. Uh, exhausted. <laughs> exalted, excuse me, I'm sorry. Anyway, but woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, says hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven. Here we go. The rabbis don't lead you to the kingdom of heaven. They lead you to the kingdom of this world, under the God of this world. They don't lead you to the kingdom of heaven. They shut up the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven can be found here, 1,189 chapters of your King James Bible. That's where you're going to find the kingdom of heaven. They shut up the kingdom of heaven. Um, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for neither, 
For ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering in to go in. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, after ye for ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense. You know what that means? You're pretending. You're pretending to be spiritual. For a pretense, make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. That's who Perry Stone is following. He's following people who have a greater damnation upon them. That's who he's going after. He's abandoning the scriptures. He starts this whole, this whole conversation out with Sid Roth by saying this verse where it says, the sun should be darkened and the moon shall turn to blood and that great notable, you know, before that great notable day of the Lord. He said, I studied that for years and he said, no one really has an understanding of this. It's very complicated. It's, it's really, you can't, you can't grasp it unless you go talk to the rabbis and read what the rabbis said about it, then you're going to have the perfect prophetic understanding about it. Wrong. Mm. You know what I think? You know how I understand uh, Joel 2, Acts chapter 2? I think the sun is going to be darkened and the moon is going to turn to blood. That's exactly what I think. No more. No less than that. It's going to happen exactly the way God said it was going to happen. It does not require me to consult the rabbis to find out what it really means. I don't need them, and I don't trust them, because they're under a damnation, a greater damnation because of who they are. Verse 15, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye compass sea and land. Here we go. Listen to this one. Ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte. Did you catch that? They came across the sea and went into the land, and they're trying to make a proselyte. You know what that is? Someone who now is going to follow their doctrine. Get it? And they found a willing heart in Perry Stone and Sid Roth and Jim Staley and all of these others. They found an open mind to turn them to following after the rabbis and the, the rabbinical scholars, the Kabbalah. They make one proselyte, and when he is made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Take that language, twofold the child of hell. And think about it. Peter said, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and bideth forever. I believe, according to scriptures, there is a born-again experience that is based upon or caused by corrupt seed, corrupt teaching, lies. Think about it. Here, the rabbis, when you believe what they say, you have been born again. But you're not just a one-fold child of hell. See, you know what a one-fold child of hell is? A one-fold child of hell is someone who's born on this earth, and without redemption by Christ, they're going to go to hell. When they are the two-fold child of hell, there's no redemption for them. They are twice dead. Or as our neighbor lady used to say, twice dead. They're twice dead. There is no hope for redemption of them. And this is what Jesus was saying about those who follow and decide that the rabbis were telling the truth. And that if you really want to understand God and Jesus and prophecy, then you believe what the rabbis tell you. And now you are a twofold more child of hell than they are. Wow. 
Verse 16, woe unto you, you blind guides, which say, whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing. But whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. Ye fools and blind. Jesus called them blind. He calls them fools. He says they're under damnation. For whether is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifieth the gold. And whosoever shall swear by the altar, it is nothing. But whosoever sweareth by the gift that is upon it, he is guilty. Ye fools and blind, for whether is greater, the gift or the altar that sanctifieth the gift. Whoso therefore shall swear by the altar, sweareth by it and by all things therein. And whoso shall swear by the temple, sweareth by it and by him that dwelleth therein. And he that shall swear by heaven, sweareth by the throne of God and by him that sitteth thereon. Woe unto you, scribe. By the way, when Jesus said woe unto them, go study woes in the book of Revelation because that's what they're going to get. He said woe unto you. Go find woe in the book of Revelation. Bingo. Uh, for ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. Ye blind guides which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Can you believe what your Bible just said to you? On the, the whole purpose of the Hebrew Roots Movement is to get you to follow earthly, outside, exterior ordinances. And they brag about... When you get into this little conversation with the Hebrew Roots people, they always slap you around and say, where were you at Passover? Did you go to a Passover feast? Did you, did you have the cedar? Did you, uh, do you do uh, 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 tabernacles? Do you do Pentecost? Do you do this? Do you do that? Do you eat pork? Well, we don't. And God is better to us than he is to you because we keep the laws. We keep the feast. We, we're the holy people on the outside. But he said, inwardly, you're full of extortion. Type in, go to a search engine, type in Jim Staley arrest. Find out what he got arrested for. Oh, he looks good on the outside. He kept, he kept, well, he, let me just, he partially kept the feast. And what do you say, what do you mean partially kept the feast? Well, number one, the Jewish Passover Seder is not in the Bible anywhere. Number two, they didn't go to Jerusalem to do it, and that was the requirement. So when they tell you they kept the feast, they were, well, we weren't being completely honest about it. But they look good on the outside. Uh, you're full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which was within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe well, unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like unto whited sepulchers, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Caskets are made to look nice and beautiful. And we would say, that is a beautiful casket. That is a lovely spray of flowers that are on that casket. That is a beautiful monument at their gravestone. I love that, that kind of marble there. That is a wonderful looking mausoleum there. That's what he said they are. They're nice looking on the outside. They're full of dead men's bones on the inside. Whew. Even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Think about it. This is who Perry Stone and Sid Roth and all of these others, this is who they follow. This is who... Perry said the only way to understand these, this hard saying in the Old Testament was to go talk to the dead men's bones. That's who he said. Um, look at verse 33. Look at what he calls them. Ye serpents. Okay. 
Here's here's what here's what here's what uh, Perry Stone just told you. What he told you was, when I wanted to understand this passage in Scripture, I went to the serpent and got my understanding from the serpent. That's what he just said. Rabbinical scholars are serpents. They are a generation of vipers. Poison is under their tongue. And when they, and, and it, isn't it beautiful or interesting how when God made serpents poisonous, he didn't put the poison in their hands because they don't have any. He didn't put it in their tail. He put it in their mouth. And when these rabbinical scholars start talking, it's pure poison to your soul. Get that. Understand that. Stay away from those who follow the serpents, the rabbinical scholars, the rabbis, the, the orthodox Jews. Stay away from that. It's poison. Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes. You know what he's saying? I gave you a Bible. I gave you a Bible. And you killed it. You killed its power over you. You decided you didn't want to hear what the prophets said. That's your Bible. Some of them you shall kill and crucify, and some of them shall you scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city. Ask, ask Paul, when you get to heaven, ask Paul what he thought of the rabbis that he encountered. That upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, son of uh, Berechias, whom you slew between the temple and the altar. Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, but ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Their house, listen, their house is desolate. That means God doesn't live there. And you decided that the Jewish sages and the rabbis and the Jewish scholars and the ultra-Orthodox and all of their mystical teachings was of greater uh, comprehension of God, Jesus, the Messiah, the Holy Spirit, the, the, the spirit of prophecy. You decided that that was more important than just reading the Bible. That's, that's what he just said. Now, you're going to hear... Sid Roth say almost exactly what I said. He's going to tell you that you will not understand prophecy, Bible prophecy, unless you go to the house of the serpents, the Hebrew roots. Listen to what he said. Well, I, I see this 80,000 hours of research, understanding the Hebraic roots. You see, it didn't have to be explained in the New Covenant, and in the New Testament, and in the Old Testament. It, everyone understood these things. Perry, would you understand where we are prophetically, what's going on prophetically, if you had never studied the Hebraic roots? It's totally impossible. Hey, okay, hold yeah, that thought. We'll impossible. be right back. <laughs> It's totally impossible to understand the New, the Old Testament, utterly impossible to understand it without Hebrew roots teaching, which comes from the serpents, the rabbis, the generation of vipers. That's what they just said. They're telling you, that yes, you can read your Bible, and yes, you can kind of get an understanding of it, 
But if you l listen to what they're setting up, it's a setup. That's what they're doing. They're setting you up for a fall. They're telling you, close your Bible, buy our books, or go find a, a rabbinical scholar, go find a, a serpent, and find out what they... So you know what this is doing? This is causing so-called Christians to go after all of these Jewish books that have been written since the time of Moses, to go read these things, to go try to under the Talmud, and, and this and that and that, to go and the Mishnah, and all of these other things, and then the Sephiroth, and then uh, the, uh, what is their book? I just drew, I was going to say the Quran, but that's the other, other guys. The uh, Zohar, that's what it was. Go read all of that. Study, study the Hebrew letters. What did you know that each Hebrew letter is a symbol of something? Like the, the letter Aleph is an ox, and that's God. God is an, is an ox. That's what they're trying to tell you. Go study their witchcraft. Go listen to what comes out of the mouth of these serpents, these rabbinical scholars, because that is the only way that you're going to understand what's going to happen in this world. I'm telling you people, they are setting you up for a fall. Now, you want to hear some witchcraft? You want to hear some Hebrew roots witchcraft? Turn to Galatians. Jim Staley says almost the exact same thing that you're going to hear Sid Roth say. I've used this quote several times. Jim Staley, and I'm going to paraphrase. I don't have the quote in front of me. I'm going to paraphrase it. Jim Staley said, essentially, I, but I'm going to try to remember it. I believe that when you keep these, um, when you, and there's, there's, I believe when you observe times in Yahweh's calendar, a portal is opened. You invoke God or something. That's something like he said. In other words, you have to do certain things on these certain days in order to really get God going for you. Paul said, Galatians 4, but now, verse 9, but now after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye desire again to be bondage? You observe days and months and times and years, four things, witchcraft. Brethren, I, be, um, uh, I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. He's telling them, you're going after the elements and observing times. You're thinking or you're being taught that that's going to open up some big new thing between you and God that nobody else will ever get because they don't do what you do. We, those, these people, they say that they interpret grace the right way. They know nothing of grace. They only know the law. They, or they think they know the law. They want to pretend that they observe the law the way God really intended it, the way we're all really supposed to be doing. And the poor rest of you Christians out there, you're not doing it the way we're doing it, hence you're not getting what we're getting. And by the way, you can get what we have for your donation of $60 or more. We'll give you these free gifts for your donation of $60 or more. It's free for $60. Listen to Sid Roth tell you about a portal that's going to open up on a feast day if you observe it the right way. Listen to what he said. Because God says these are my feasts. And in the Hebrew, the word for feast is, these are my appointments. And many have found that when you worship God on his feast, there's like a portal 
a, an amazing portal to heaven where the glory of God can come upon you and the angels can come up and down mm -hmm. the ladder. I mean, the devil knows why he attacks yes, us, but Christians must know. Did you catch that? Many Now, here's his authority for saying this. His authority for saying this is many people are finding out. That's his authority. That when you do and perform rituals on these feast days, that a key is inserted in a lock and a door is opened, a portal is opened. And are you ready for this one? When that happens, angels begin ascending and descending up and down the ladder. You know what that is? That's DNA. You catching that? They're telling you that if you perform our little witchcraft scenario, that you're going to open a portal that has been shut. Stop right here. Jesus said, I am he that shutteth and no man openeth. And I am he that openeth and no man shutteth. That's what Jesus said. Jesus said, I am the only one with the key. I'm the only one who can open it if it's shut. Not you. Not your little prayer rituals. Not your little pseudo-feast keeping ceremonies on these high religious days when you observe times. When you go after the weak and beggarly elements. Not you. Jesus and him alone. Jesus said, if it's closed, you can't open it. I don't care how many little dances you do. I don't care how many lambs you kill and eat on Passover. I don't care how many chairs you set aside for Elijah to come back and sit on. I don't care what you do. You can't open the door. Only I can do that. It's a setup. It is a set up. And people will, people will send the $60 donation to get the free books. Because that's what they were told to do. And if you don't get that teaching, you will never understand the Bible. You'll never understand it. That in itself is contradictory to the scriptures. When you are saved and you have the spirit of the living God dwelling inside of you, the Spirit of God's Son crying, Abba, Father, when you have that in you, you have no need that any man should teach you. You know why? Because you, just, you have just as much right to open your Bible, ask God for illumination and inspiration, and get it. You have just as much right to do that as I do or any preacher or any stoned Perry evangelist teacher or any Sid Roth or anybody else. You've got just as much right to get it as anybody does. Why? Because the Holy Ghost is your teacher. That which the Holy Ghost teaches, not the damned uh, serpent seed rabbis. And when I say the word damned, I'm not saying, oh, that blankety blank. Exactly what Jesus said. They're under damnation. But that's what they, that's what Roth, Perry Stone, Staley, that's what all these other people and countless others. They're going to draw you away from the King James Bible. They're going to say, you know what? You can't understand it anyway. In fact, it's not even right. We've studied the original Hebrew, and we're telling you the King James is not even right. So just close it. Buy our books and, and our videos and our CDs, and then you can have what we have if you pay the money. That's, that's harlotry and witchcraft, people, pure and simple. Um, as promised today, 
I'm I'm sitting here looking at emails. I'll turn my monitor around just a little bit here so you can so I can see it clearer. Uh, Jay writes in favorite song is Give the World a Smile. Give the World a Smile, my neighbor across the street. Uh, oh, there's a period here. Give the world a smile each day. He says, my neighbor across the street. Let's see here. I have no idea what that. I'm sorry, Jay. I cannot. I can't follow you. Uh, put some periods in there so I can understand it. All right. Um, Sebastiano and Tiffany Valenti. Uh, last week, I texted you about those planes that spray in the air. They call them chemtrails. Most don't believe our government's up to something, but I saw a pentagram in the sky out of the center. It looked like a demonic spirit come out of it. I'm not crazy. I know what I saw. Um, I am not the world's biggest expert on these trails in the sky. I'm not. Um I have said, I will say what I've said before. Um, I don't understand. Uh, I don't, I don't research it very much. I don't understand where people are coming from with it. Some say that it is a government depopulation program. They spray harmful chemicals in the upper atmosphere so that they will depopulate the country. If that's true, it is the worst program ever by the government. It's not working. It's not working. Our population in America is not decreasing. It's increasing. So maybe it's a fertility drug they're spraying because it's not reducing the population of anything. Uh, and so I am, um, again, I'm, I don't know what you saw. I can't pass judgment one way or the other. I just don't spend a lot of time looking. At, do I believe that there are planes that are spraying stuff up there? Yeah, I do. I think there's, I think, weather, weather modification, and is that a good idea? I don't really think so. But as far as a depopulation program, surely they could come up with something better than that because it's not working. All right? Um, let's see here. Uh, da -da, da -da -da -da. Barbara wants to know, what is Reformed worship? Why is it important? Uh, you know what? I don't know, Barbara. That I, my guess... If I were to take a guess at what Reformed worship would be, I would say that it's probably not a good idea. Reformed, which means that they didn't like the old form of worship. Everybody stand, take your hymn book, turn to hymn number 325, and let's sing the first, second, and last stanza of this song. They don't like that. My guess is Reformed worship has a lot to do with rituals, uh, repeated phrases over and over and over, which Jesus told us not to do. My understanding of most worship that's going on now, or what they call worship right now, I started hearing teachings about this back in the 90s. And, I'm, and, and just all of a sudden, all of a sudden now, I'm hearing guys at, uh, you know, at Bible camps, youth camps and things like that, you hear them, they're just emphasizing worship. And they make statements like, um, if you really want to get close to God, then God will be there when you are worshiping him. If you want God, to, God will withhold things from you until you worship or you approach him in worship. And I'm, and I'm just going, you know what, it, just, it doesn't, doesn't sound right. Where is this coming from? And then as, as time went on, I, I began to educate myself about how the devil works, about how these beasts work. Um, about rituals itself and the symbolism behind rituals, like the fire tunnel in the anti-Bethel church, Redding, California, Bill Johnson. They, these people line up on both sides. They make people pass through the fire. That I get. 
That's right out of the scriptures, but it's not good. God forbid the practice. And what I think is going on is that the churches have been introduced to the concept that if you sing the right words and if you close your eyes tight enough and if you raise your hands for a 28-minute worship marathon and if we sing this song, these lyrics, 20 or 30 times in a row, then God will inhabit us because we're performing these rituals. If that's what it is, it's wrong. The God that I serve requires no rituals. He requires no works. He requires no uh, performances. That's what grace is. Grace is God bestowing his favor upon you, whether it's salvation or healing or a blessing or any other thing. God bestowing his grace and his blessing on you in spite of the fact that you haven't done anything to deserve it or you haven't done anything to invoke God or wake him up. That's what real worship is done in spirit and in truth. You know what that means? It's done biblically from the, from the scriptures, from the spirit. My words are spirit, and the truth, thy word is truth. We were in Kenya, two different places, and we saw two different uh, styles of worship, but both of them were very, very active physically. And one group in Tala, we were, we were watching them as they worshiped God and sang their songs, and they put their bodies into it. Us Mzungus, we ain't got it. We could imitate them robotically, but we can't do it. It's not us. But we could perceive that the Spirit was there too. And then we went to Western Kenya, and there was a man there leading, and I saw God break him through that week. I mean, God just worked a good thing in this, and you saw him toned down. First time we saw him, though, he was putting on the biggest show. It, it just looked like a circus act, what he was doing out in front of everybody, and that's what they call worship. And me and Mike and Brent were just going, uh-uh, we're not going to let that get by. And Mike preached about it one day. But God began to get a hold of that man's heart all throughout that week, and boy, I mean, he changed. He changed while we were there. But he was way in the flesh, and I just, I think that any kind of this emphasis on church worship and how that our churches are, are, are not getting anything done for God. It's because we're not worshiping him. I think that's a setup too. Of course, you're going to think, oh, Hoggard, you think everything's a setup. Read your Bible. Read your Bible. If it's in the Bible, go for it. If it's not, it's a setup. Um, Christine. Let's see here. So far, with my limited understanding, I think technology can definitely merge with humanity through the mark of the beast functioning as a virus. Not bad. Okay? I think the mark of the beast, which is going to be received in the hand or head, will be something small. Viruses are small. And I think nanotechnology that is also biological, technological, biotechnological that when received will change the nature and image of man to the image of the beast and connecting mankind into his beast system. I think you're right so far. FYI, I believe the supercomputer in Europe that connects the World Wide Web is called the beast. Now, I think, Christine, that that is very old, outdated rumor. I think. I remember in the 80s, in the 80s, um, we heard preachers, this is for the internet, we heard preachers preach that the European um, Union had a com supercomputer that handled all of the financial transactions um, in the European Union and they nicknamed it the Beast. Um, I don't know if that was true then. I don't know if it was ever true. It was just one of those, I don't know if you remember that. You, you, I, I remember hearing lots of rumors 
uh, prophetic rumors back in the 80s, and none of them panned out, not one of them. If you remember going back into the 80s, uh, the, the, what they called the European Common Market back then, which is now the European Union, it was only supposed to be 10 nations, and that was going to be the 10 kings, and it was going to be the revived Roman Empire. Well, the European Union is way more than 10 nations now. And you have to ask yourself, what kind of power do they really have over the rest of the world? Not any more than America or Russia or China or South Korea, for that matter, has. They just, it's just not there. And so anyway, I don't mean to, don't mean to diminish what you're saying because I like what you've said so far. But I think that that thing about the computer in Europe being called the beast, I, it, that it con connects the World Wide Web, I don't think that that, I don't think it's true. Don't hate me. Look into it. Um, she says, I believe the mark is the way to accomplish it all. It will change our biology, human nature, and affect our spirituality, bring you, amen, bring you to humanity, death in every form, and marring the very image of God which God created mankind in. This is how humans will become temples of the beast, antichrist, rather than temples of the Holy Spirit. Think Bible, think small, think virus. Christine, I think you're very, very close. Um, think about this. God will dwell in a temple that's not made with hands, hence the human body. The human body, and I don't care whose human body it is, God will dwell in a temple that was not made with hands, hence the human body. God will dwell in any human who will come to him for mercy and grace and say, I'm that new covenant, I'm there. Once mankind alters this temple it is becomes a temple made with hands and god will not dwell there um that's something that i am that's it's in my notes for the singularity project all right you pr you pray for me that God will give me the insight that he wants me to have. Because I can tell you, there's always, um, you know, my, my flesh nature says, well, Mike, just go, go with this. I mean, it sounds good. And I don't want to do that. I don't want to just make something up that sounds cool. I don't want to do that. What I want is for God to direct me from the pages of this Bible. I see it in the scriptures. I present it to you. Here it is. This is thus saith the Lord. That's what I'm interested in. So you pray for me that God will give me wisdom and instruction and understanding that I'll get it from the Holy Ghost. And when I get it from the Holy Ghost, it's there. It's, it's right. I know it is. I can prove it with scripture. So pray for me. Tommy, Pastor Mike, God bless. How much do you know about Saturn worship? I know the Pope wears a hat called the Saturno. And it's that red cowboy looking hat that has the wide brim on it. It's supposed to look like the planet Saturn. And the planet Saturn is basically what Ezekiel saw in Ezekiel chapter 1 where he saw rings around the wheel. Go look at that. Um, the planet Saturn is worshipped. There was the Saturnalia feast back in the Roman pagan days. Um, the seven planetary uh, luminaries were always worshipped by those in the Kabbalah, those in um, uh, Rosicrucianism. It's a concept in Freemasonry. It goes along with the number seven. And the seventh planetary object that they felt like had uh, control over the earth was the planet Saturn. Um, and so I, I absolutely think that there is something diabolical about the representation of that, of that object up there. And if you remember, see, they called them the seven stars. That's what they referred to them as, the seven stars or the seven planets, um, Saturn being the seventh. And um, I equate that with the seven heads of the beast which are, I think are the opposite of the seven 
uh, spirits of God. And Tommy, you note something in here about um, the there is a hexagram, or a, excuse me, a hexagon at Saturn's North Pole. We just recently found that out. Within the last few years, we sent a probe out to Saturn, and it's looking at Saturn, and it's looking at its North Pole, and there is a very clear, perfectly proportioned hexagon made by the cloud formations at the North Pole of Saturn. What in the world is that doing there? Nobody has the answer. I think that it means something. Um, and so anyway, uh, Tommy, I appreciate Let me. I didn't read everything you, you said here. Uh, every religion except for true biblical Christianity is Saturn worship. Uh, here are a few examples. Sixth day of the week, sixth planet from the sun, the sixth point of star is Saturn. Uh, the cube, that is why we have a square, triangle, circle, and X on gaming controllers. I, that's interesting. That's a new one. I haven't heard of that one. Uh, but anyway, it's an interesting concept. Uh, Watch your bab says, Hi, Pastor Mike, is it possible that by way of nanobots in the water and GMO foods could have a huge effect on computerizing our bodies, especially after they accumulate in the body over time? Um, watch your bob. I love you too, brother. Here's what I don't know. I don't know that right now we are consuming nanobots in water and genetically modified foods. My assumption in reading your email is that there are websites out there on the in internet land that are telling you that when you are eating genetically modified foods and drinking some kinds of water, I'm just guessing here, that you are already consuming nanobots that are going to take over your body. I don't know that that's true, and I'll tell you why. Uh, number one, not everything on the Internet's true. And if you don't believe me, ask the Internet. Okay? Which is kind of a, it's going to put you in a quandary. If you ask the Internet, is everything on the Internet true? And it comes back with the answer, uh, now, let's see, how, how could you put that? Are there things on the Internet that's a lie? And if it comes back, yes, how do you know that that's not a lie? But then if it would be no, then that would be a lie, too. And Anyway, you wouldn't know. Um, when you say after they accumulate in our body over time, I, don't, I haven't seen that. I have not seen where the things that we're eating right now, like Ritz crackers or you know, Tyson chicken uh, or any other, you know, soy sauce made out of soybeans that would be genetically modified or the corn uh, or Fritos or anything like that, that we're eating nanobots that are building up in our... I have not seen that. Now, do I believe in genetically modified organisms? Absolutely. They're doing it right now. I've reported on it. I believe that they're doing it. Does the fact that I eat corn out of ignorance that is genetically modified, does that in turn modify my DNA? I don't think so. I'm, I'm me. I'm still me. Um, I think when it comes to this discussion, we're looking at the future of humankind where the false prophet makes everybody receive a mark on the right hand or forehead, that alteration is coming. But that alteration, hang on a second, that alteration is, what's the word I'm looking for? By choice. Mankind will choose to have his mind and body altered on purpose. So I don't, I don't really think that if we eat too much genetically modified corn chips, that it's going to alter our DNA and make us not human. I don't think that. Let me, there was an email that came in right at the beginning of the broadcast, and I was going to read it. I'm going to put it in here because I, I like it. This is 
Um, I got one of the watchers out there. He's reading some books. One is called The Externalization of the Hierarchy by Elise Bailey or Alice Bailey, depending on however you want to pronounce it. And he says, I find it interesting in light of Revelation 13. Preceding this quote is talk about the hierarchy, which are devils, spirits, familiar spirits, influencing people via telepathy. They are influencing them consciously and unconsciously via the science of impression. It goes on to say the following. Now, this is a quote from Elise Bailey in the externalization of the hierarchy. She was, Elise Bailey was a student of Helena Blavatsky. Quote, the ordinary devoted person who constantly pledges and dedicates himself to the Christ or to the Master, the Christ, which is the new age one, in a spirit of adoration will not be chosen for this specific training. Their own attitudes and development come violently between them and their objective. The man who forgets about himself and who is more interested in helping unhappy human beings but who is nevertheless staunchly convinced of the fact of the unseen worlds is the man for whom search is at this time being made. In other words, we're looking for a certain group of people to go along with the plan. And then it says, when these men and women are found, the work of discovering initiate is to see to it that for information comes to the aspirant in some form or another, um, something the hierarchical plan, concerning the reappearance of the Christ, under some name familiar to the aspirant's religious background, and about the fundamental and needed occult truths. Here, listen to this. With particular emphasis upon the law of cause and effect, and secondarily upon the law of rebirth. The law of cause and effect is far greater importance than the law of rebirth because it necessitates action upon the part of the aspirant, and that action inevitably conditions the future. Now, let me put this in easy terms. There is a, a universal law called the law of cause and effect. If I take my finger like this and I flick it at this pen, okay, watch what happens. Cause and effect. The pen goes flying through the air because I caused it to go flying through the air. That's cause and effect. That is a, that's what Bailey was talking about. She felt like the law of cause and effect was of higher importance than anything, and it falls into the idea, Revelation chapter 13, the false prophet causes all, not forces all. The false prophet spirit, the false prophet system, Perry Stone, Sid Roth, Jim Staley, Billy Graham, um, Kenneth Copeland, John Hagee, Francis the Talking Pope, et al., which means, which is Latin for, and guy's name Al. The false prophet system right now is setting up the cause, the effect is going to be falling and worshiping the wrong Jesus. Because if Perry Stone says that the only way to understand the second coming is to go to the rabbinical scholars in the Hebrew roots, and the rabbinical scholars and those in the Hebrew roots, the rabbis and the Mishnah, and all of those other books, the Zohar, the Christ that they believe in is not the same Jesus that the Bible talks about. They're causing everyone to worship the wrong Jesus. And I think that's true when it comes to these things that we eat, something to remember. Now, I'm not, trust me, if, if I knew that something that we bought at the store, if I found out later that some product we bought at the store had genetically modified junk in it, I'd probably say, you know, honey, or I tell you what, Lisa may 
tell me about it more than anything. And she does every now and then. She'll say, you know, that's got, that's got some of that junk in it. Oh, well, I don't want that. I think it's clear. You could stay away from that stuff. You probably should anyway. But remember something. We were promised in the Scriptures that as soldiers of Christ, as disciples of Christ, followers of Jesus Christ, that if there was ever a circumstance where you ended up drinking poison, it, God would not allow it to harm you. And I think that there is something more powerful than whatever corruption might be in something that we eat. I think it's called prayer and thanksgiving, which allows us as New Testament believers to even eat pork because that meat in itself, even though classified by the law as unclean, hence the forbidden to eat it. Why did God say you don't eat pork? Because it was unclean. But then if God cleans the pork, the law doesn't apply. And that's what we do. So I, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I am not... I don't go to sleep at night hoping to God that I didn't eat something genetically modified so that I don't die in my sleep and then burn in hell. I don't fear that. But I also don't want a bunch of experimented on stuff floating around in my body doing God only knows what to me behind the scenes. I don't want that. So if I find out that I've been eating something that it's not good or they, they've changed it some way or whatever, I would probably say, you know what, I, I'm just, I'm not going to eat that junk anymore. I'm going to go buy, you know, make my own or something like that. All right. So Bob, again, I am not too worried about what I'm eating right now, accumulating and building up nanobots in my system. I don't think it's that subtle and seductive. I don't think that a good, born-again, Bible-believing Christian is going to wake up one day on the side of evil because of it. Now, if I, if I miss the whole gist of your email, then forgive me, all right? And you can explain it to me in a different one, all right? Uh, Barbara says, what scriptures support that the sacraments, baptism and communion, become effectual means of salvation? Mm. Zero. There are no verses in the Bible that say that baptism and communion are means of salvation. Zero. That's exactly what I've been talking about, this whole thing about doing rituals. Do I believe in baptism? Absolutely. But baptism only shows on the outside what the Holy Ghost has already done on the inside. It doesn't do it itself. It cannot. Thus, eating the bread and the fruit of the vine in a, in a Lord's Supper, does that, does that make you saved? Does that give you the God on the inside of you? No, absolutely not. So, Barbara, there are no scriptures that support that. Uh, David and Jean, Jean, J-E-A-N. I uh, hope you and family are doing well. We are. Thank you. When you mentioned on your watch about the web being an, an analogous to a spider web, it made sense to me. Um, do you think that the mark of the beast is going to be the means by which every human alive at the, at the time Antichrist is on the scene will be connected to this beast? I th think so. By the way, there's another word to look at that I didn't think of. It's called net. Study nets in the Bible. Because that's what a spider's web is. It's a net. You could probably say that's where humans got the idea. They're going, look what that spider's doing. And he's catching bugs. And he, Wow. I wonder if we can make something like that. That could be how it happened. But anyway, study nets in the Bible. Um, would this mean this coming Antichrist will be a hybrid with all the computing knowledge of this world within it? It seems like it to me. Yes, I, that's what I think. And this kind of represents the, the quandary I'm in. I'm wanting to make the connection between the technology terminology and the Bible terminology. Now, I'll give you an example. You hear Newagers talking about 
everything has its vibrations and its frequencies and its waves. And that DNA can be, all DNA is a crystal, so it has its own vibrations, man. It's got its own frequency. And it's like giving you your aura. And DNA can be changed and augmented by using different frequencies. Um, there's even some information on the internet that says that all of the piano tuners in the world are tuning pianos and guitars to the wrong frequency and thus it's causing all this rampant immorality and opening us up to demonic possession in this world. A440, those of you who know anything about music, you know what that is. A, the, the note A, which is below middle C, I think, or above one. I'm one of the two. Anyway, um, A at 440 cycles per second is the common tuning of pianos, guitars, trumpets, flutes, and keyboards all over the world. There is a lower um, frequency that used to be in place. I don't know when it was changed or whatever, but they're saying that's that's God's one there. That that'll that won't let demons come into you. I don't believe that. I don't believe that. It's not in the Bible. It's not biblical. The idea would suppose that every time we play Rock of Ages Clef for Me in our church, that we're not really worshiping God, we're inviting demons in. So I just don't buy that. But let me get my point here. My point is that I, I was I kept hearing all about frequencies and tuning into the right frequencies and then getting our DNA tuned into this frequency and I and I'm going, okay, there's I see a bunch of stuff on the internet about it. What is it? What is it? And I just was thinking, thinking, thinking about what frequency were. They were waves. I then took my Bible search program and I typed in wave or waves and I looked at all the occurrences in the King James Bible of the word wave and waves. You do it. You do it. Think now think of here here's the concept that different frequencies beamed at your DNA will cause changes in it and you'll have third strand DNA. That's what they say. Now look at waves in the Bible. Okay. Um, anyway. So I am looking for, I'm looking at the terminology of technology, looking for its equivalent in the scriptures. That's one of the things that I'm just kind of, I'm bugged over it. My wife has asked, asked me this morning, is your blood sugar high? Are you because you're not really talking? I said, "Hun, I've got, I've got a lot on my mind. Things I'm trying to figure out." And I said, "That's I got a lot to do and very little time to do it." She's, oh, she's used to that, by the way. Uh, let's see here. Dear Pastor Mike, this is from Tamara. Don't know if you saw or remember this, but I thought it's fitting for the subject at hand. A um, Fox News article, Freaky Physics Proves Parallel Universes. And here's a quote from it. Uh, Look past the details of a wonky discovery by a group of California scientists that a quantum state is now observable with the human eye and consider its implications. Time travel may be feasible. Uh, the strange discovery by quantum physicists at the University of California means that an object you can see in front of you may exist simultaneously in a parallel universe. That's interesting. A multi-state condition that has scientists theorizing that traveling through time may be much more than just the plaything of science fiction writers. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to pull that up and save that in my notes. Thank you, Tamara. Tamara. Uh, let's see here. Don says, Pastor Mike, a qubit is a quantum bit. I got that. This being the smallest unit of information in quantum computing. Qubits hold an exponentially larger amount of information than traditional bits. Qubit is a combination of the words quantum and bits. Got that. The analogy would be like the human uh, seed. I'm going to use that term. 
uh, which holds an extraordinary amount of compressed information than the ordinary cells in the fully developed human body. I hope this helps. It does. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that's kind of where I'm going with it. All right. Uh, let's see here. Uh, da, 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 da. Mediacom writes in, says, Mike, here's something I don't get. When the Hebrew roots folks sin, where are the Levite priests, altars, bullocks, etc., that are being sacrificed to cover these sins? If they are following the law, shouldn't they atone for sin according to the law? God bless Gary. Um, here is, and I agree with you, but here's how they would put it. They always try to tell you, now, these ceremonial and sacrificial laws have already been fulfilled by Yeshua HaMashiach. It's the ritual laws, and it's this law, and the feast laws that we are supposed to do, and the, and the uh, dietary laws that we're supposed to follow. But the other ones have been fulfilled. And so here's what you have. Here Jesus said, I think that, that I've come, not come, think not that I've come to destroy the law. I've not come to destroy the law. I came to fulfill the law. So here's what you are, are saying. You're saying that Jesus Christ didn't do it right at his first coming. That he didn't put an end to the law and its dominion over our souls at his crucifixion resurrection. That's what, that's what they're saying. They're saying that Christ was only sufficient and his death on the cross was only sufficient for sacrificial laws. But the rest of the, you gotta do it if you're gonna be saved and Here's I'm I've been going through the life of Saul and Solomon. And here's what I got to say about Solomon. Solomon did it all. As far as I can see from Solomon's life, he broke every commandment that there was. And he went to heaven. How? by grace, not certainly not by keeping any laws. And God let Solomon do that to show two things. Number one, your search for the ultimate of sinful experiences, no matter what it is, will not produce the results that you think it will. Number two, God forgives all sins, period, and puts them under grace, and that's how we're saved. So that's kind of uh, how I think they approach it, is that Christ only died for um, and only abolished the sacrificial law system. But the other ones, you got to keep if you're going to go, or you have to keep them if you want the portal open so that these beings of light can be walking up and down your DNA ladder. Uh, Kathy in South Bend. I've been there. South Bend, Indiana. Michael Crichton's book, Timeline, opens with an introduction that reads like a real history of computing. It describes what quantum computing can do, and the rest of the novel is about a group of people who time travel to the 13th century. It's pretty good reading. Here's a link to the intro from Amazon. Uh, thank you. Uh, for Kathy for sending me that, that is something that I'm going to look at, and I'll tell you why. I found that novelists like Dan Brown, Michael Crichton, and, and others, um, they have an ability to take these scientific ideas or even these occult ideas like Dan Brown and put them in an understandable form as part of their novel. And I, I picked up on this when I'm reading the Da Vinci Code because everybody else in the world is reading the Da Vinci Code. And I thought I knew what it was about. And I, I was ignoring it. And then I started reading it and I went, whoa, this is wild. 
Uh, Brown and these guys, they do an incredible amount of research, and they actually grasp it before they novelize it, write it in some sort of fictitious story. So I, I appreciate you sending me that. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, okay, I know who you are. Big deal. Um, that's the racist hater guy. Um, let's see here. These are articles. I'm going to have to bypass those because I can't really read all of that online. Um, Patty says, Jesus said, woe to you eight times in Matthew 23. Dun, 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 dun. That's pretty cool. Eight is one of the numbers associated with the beast in Revelation 17. Um, let's see here. Bruce writes in and says, The word portal is not mentioned in the KJ Bible, but Jesus said he was the door. Do you think the CERN super collider is trying to find the door? Now that, you're dead on, Bruce. Now, Jesus said he was the door of the sheepfold, okay? Unless I'm, unless I'm missing something here. Uh, Jesus said he was the door of the sheepfold. But there is a door that is closed, and it's, it's the gate to hell. The gates to hell are closed right now, and they're awaiting being opened because those devils that are down in there, Revelation 9, they want out. And that door is going to be open one day because Christ is going to give that star that falls from heaven, who I think is Lucifer, the key. And he's... Christ is going to let him open it. But for what purpose? Okay? They're going to fulfill the will of God. They just don't know it. Satan's going to get that key and going, I got the key. You mean I can open it? Knock yourself out. You're not going to do something to me, are you? Nah. Open it up. Go ahead. See what happens. And he opens it up. I think CERN which is the horned god of witchcraft, um, I think what they're trying to do there is figure out how to open that door. Okay? That's what I think. Bruce, appreciate that. Um, let's see here. Peter says, Dear Mike, I have to say on a few occasions, I have been linked to a Sid Roth video and the person who was being interviewed and their testimony was very good. However, I would not recommend people listen to this, listen to his programs. I wouldn't either. I mean, all this guy does is promote Hebrew roots and supernatural, unbiblical experiences and prophecies and revelations. That's all he does. And it has no place following the teachings that are on this show have no place in the Bible students' time or understanding. Um, it's just like, why wouldn't you eat something that's been genetically modified? Well, I don't know what it'll do to me. Ergo, I don't think I would sit and watch and read a lot of this stuff that's on the Internet because you'll never know how it might mess up your thinking. Just do this. Okay? You do that. Think Bible. God will bless you. Um, Marty says, Hi, Marty. Hi, Pastor Mike. I think Reformed worship is Calvinism, worshiping God according to John Calvin. Thank you for this wonderful teaching today and keeping us watchmen aware of the serpents who are doing their best to devour us. Uh, you know, that's what I thought originally, you know, because of Reformed theology is basically Calvinism uh, with a new label on it. And I am not a disciple of John Calvin. And for the mere reason that he was not an apostle. John Calvin wasn't. Jacob Arminius wasn't. Uh, St. Augustine was not. Max Lucado is not. Chuck um, Chuck Swindoll is not. Joyce is not. David Jeremiah is not. These guys are not apostles. 
Why would we follow their doctrine? Why would we follow their theology? Why would we follow them at all? Why would we call ourselves, well, I'm a Calvinist. I believe in this and that. Why would we say that? It's, they're not apostles. They didn't write the doctrine of God. They studied. They came up with some skewed idea of this, that, or the other. Why would people study John Calvin when they could study Paul? So anyway, that's kind of what I thought. Uh, since the word reformed was in there, um, that it might be linked to this repackaging of Calvinism, but I, I, I'm not, I'm, I wasn't sure about that, so I appreciate you sending that in. Um, what, uh, Renee says, what in your opinion are the secret chambers? Matthew 24, 26. Um, right now, I don't know. They're secret. And I, I just, I mean, I'm not being facetious or sarcastic. Well, maybe I am just a little bit. But I really, I really don't know what those secret chambers are, all right? Um, but I think we're going to. I think we'll know one of these days, okay? Uh, let's see here. David says, Pastor, I did not hear any salvation message in these guys preaching. You keep doing what you're doing. Uh, we need the truth. Very few are preaching it. David, I appreciate that, but I promise you there's more out there than you know of. God promised to send pastors, plural, not a pastor. I appreciate your, your sentiments toward me. Um, I love it. I love doing what I'm doing. I love finding the hungry people that are out there. That gives me a lot of joy, but I promise you I'm not the only one. There's other ones out there, okay? Um, but you're right. You hear a lot of sensationalism. Um, you hear a lot of, um, of ooh, wow, supernatural stuff. Uh, how much gospel do you hear? Uh, let's see here. Jay, I'm not following you. I'm, I'm going to read your email, and then I'm going to say, I'm not sure what you're saying here. Um, Jay says, tears, T-E-A-R-S. Is that tears or tears? Like a tear, like a, a rip in a fabric. Is one of the ways of bringing DNA with technology together. I, I'm not following you on that. So if you can clear that up for me, I would appreciate it. Uh, Bev says, hi, Pastor Mike. They're advertising on television a website called 23andMe. Um, it is to research the ancestry of your DNA. Sounds fishy with everything. And that's Google. Google owns that company, 23andMe. Um, and I, I've read some, I read some things about how Google was taking people's DNA and analyzing it and, and processing it and then finding out what your ancestry was. And there was another startup company that Ray Kurzweil was a part of that figured out a new way of doing it in Literally within, it's like a one-hour photo thing. You get it, you get get the results nearly instantly, whereas the way that Google's doing it takes you know days to do it, and so it's it's sort of like old, um, sort of like old technology that goes. But I agree with the idea. They're wanting to look at everybody's DNA as if. They were looking for something. What it is they're looking for, I don't know. Where do they think they'll find it? I'm not sure about that either. Is it possible that remnants of the giants from the Old Testament, remnants from Og, remnants from the son of Anak, remnants of the Rephaims and these other civilizations that existed in Canaan that the Israelites did not destroy all of, is it possible that there are remnants of that seed still on the earth today? I haven't seen the scripture either way. I've not seen the scripture that says they were all obliterated. They were all done away with. I have not seen the scripture that says 
they're still around. Is it possible? I think it is possible. Um, and it's possible that that might be um, that might be what they're looking for. It's just a guess on my part. All right. Um, Diane says seven deadly sins, seven spirits that Jesus cast out of Mary Magdalene related. You think to the conversation about Saturn? Absolutely. I have the seven devils that were cast out of Mary Magdalene. The Roman Catholic Church seven deadly sins, hence seven sacraments, are all part and parcel of these these luminary bodies. The seven, I the Watchmen broadcast I did. I don't have my notes. That's why I can't bring it all to remembrance. The seven dwarves are representative of that. Um, are related to that. The Watchmen broadcast I did on the number seven. Um, will might shed some extra light on that for you, all right? So, Diana, look that up. Uh, Sebastiano and Tiffany says, Pastor, I don't believe the food will hurt you when you pray over all the food you eat. I have faith that God has cleansed the food due to my asking him to do so. I, Subby, I agree with you, okay? That's just kind of, um, that's just kind of my, my thinking on it, all right? Uh, let's see here. Well, well, we got a couple minutes left here. See what we can get done. Karen says, Dear Pastor Mike, I was reading this article earlier about an artificial intelligence that can feel and detect a person's emotions. I've seen this movie. It's not good. When I read the name of this so called emo spark, that's a new one. Emo spark, that's a new one. I'm writing that down. Emo for emotional. That's why they call these these youngsters with the dress in black all the time. They call them emo. It's short for their emotional state, uh, and it's a very deadly, very very bad thing that young people are getting involved in now is the emo movement. But anyway, it's like the gothic thing, only it's gone a step lower. Uh, the emo spark. I thought of your teachings on the divine spark, and top it all off, it attaches to your own technology like a phone or a camera. I must agree that technology is heading toward a merge with humans in their DNA as possibly part of the mark. Thanks for opening my eyes to this via the Bible. Uh, thanks, Karen, but pray for me because, again, I'm just, I'm, I'm bugged that there's something that's just not clicking for me. I don't even know how to describe it. Um, so just pray that. God will either give it to me or God will give it to you, and you can send me the email, okay? Um, Watcher Doyle, how you doing, bud? In the Netherlands, Acts, or Matthew 15, 11, not that which goeth into the mouth defileth the man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth the man. You nailed it. Uh, appreciate that. Um, Mike is sending me an email on an event called Perry Stone, Your Prayer Language and How to Interpret It. Oh, my goodness. Mike, appreciate you sending me that. Um, Joseph says, about understanding the computer world, Mike, don't forget Tron 1 and 2. It is clear they showed more of the movies than most understand at this point in time. Uh, Genesis 11, 6. Take care, Mike. God bless you. I might go back and watch that, both of them. The old Tron and the new Tron. Neutron. That's that's interesting. Gotta go. It's good to be with you today. Had fun listening to your comments and your questions and all that stuff. I still some more in the bin. Couldn't get to you. Uh, but maybe we'll do this again sometime. You pray for me as I study again. I'm not sure if I'm going to get a watchman out this week. I want to make sure that it's right before I before I put it out. Okay, so you, you just pray for me and, and bear with me. All right, God bless you. We will see you some other time. Remember, think Bible.